Hello and welcome to Lagos, Nigeria, studios of New Central. The headlines for this are... Authorities in South Africa arrest two more persons over public violence that hit parts of the country last month. Heavy flood affects 380,000 people in South Sudan. UN Security Council renews sanctions on targeted Malians for obstructing 2015 peace agreement. Details shortly. Of yours in Africa and the rest of the world, this is Continental Prime on New Central Television. I'm Suleiman Alede. The news begins in South Africa, where another two people alleged to be co instigators of the public violence that hit parts of the country last month have been arrested. One of those arrested uh, has been taken in by the police. So one of the arrests took place in KwaZulu Natal, while the other took place in Gauteng. The arrest follows scenes of looting, unrest and public violence in two provinces in the country at the beginning of last month, which caused billions of runs in property damage. The arrest started after former South African President Jacob Zuma was incarcerated for his 15-month contempt of court case. Police say the investigations against those who incite, instigate or conspire with others to commit crimes, including public violence. Joining me now for more on this is editor and journalist Candace Bailey. Uh, good to see you Candace and uh, well what do we know about the people arrested? Good evening Suleiman. Indeed the two people that were arrested at the weekend, one in Kwazulu Natal and one in Gauteng. In Gauteng we see a 36 year old mother of two who was arrested and we know that her arrest has been linked to some very inflammatory remarks that she posted on her social media account um, at the time of the unrest. In KwaZulu-Natal, we have um, a 35-year-old security guard at a shopping mall that was arrested from what we understand uh, based on the charges he's facing is that it's linked to a video that he had made um, on the 11th of July where he had said that the shopping mall that he was guarding was closed, but if it were open the next day, he would be, um, they would be entering and looting. What we understand happened on the 12th of July at the Brookside Mall in KwaZulu-Natal that it was looted and significantly torched. Um, and, and that is what his case relates to. You know, that's uh, a big feat uh, for, uh, for, for the authorities in South Africa uh, trying to apprehend some of uh, these uh, instigators. But again, what happens in terms of uh, the cases that will be brought against uh, these and others? In, in, that's correct, Suleiman. In fact, there are 18 people that have been arrested. At the beginning of the unrest, at the beginning of July, when we had these terrible scenes in South Africa, our President Cyril Ramaphosa um, addressed the nation and said that he believed that there were 12 instigators that they were investigating and looking into. We now know that there are 18 people. And of the 18 people that have been arrested, there have been some very high-profile people. We've seen an advocate being involved in those, in those cases. We've seen um, a former radio DJ on a vernacular radio station, and this is a radio station called Cozy FM be arrested. There's also been one of the activists in the Fees Must Fall protest from 2015, where they were protesting against the, the rising school of higher education fees, also be involved. Now, some of these people are still in custody, and some of them have been given bail. Um, in fact, Zama, uh, Zama Swazi, who appeared at the weekend, who was arrested, the mother of two that was arrested at the weekend, she has now since been given bail in, in the Gauteng court. Um, the security guard, he, was, he appeared in camera, and he hasn't been given bail yet. They've been that he needs to go into a before police lineup, as well as some of the other people in, in Gauteng. The arrests are across the, across the country. They're not only in Gauteng and in um, KwaZulu-Natal. They are also in the Free State, and that's where the police have obviously been able to track um, all these different people and, and the, the, who they believe are instigators in these cases. And the cases are ongoing. 
Well, it would seem that, uh, well, uh, there are probably of issues, you know, leading up to this uh, uh, protest because initially uh, everyone thought uh, they were all linked to the incarceration of uh, the former president, Jacob Zuma. Uh, now there's also been these developments you highlighted. So what then happens uh, uh, to some of those that will be arrested, especially now that we see that, uh, well, we have some other issues that uh, the country is dealing with? Indeed, indeed. What we're seeing is that I think, obviously, as the police have mentioned um, in, a, in a statement they released earlier this week, is that the investigations are still ongoing. Some of the cases are linked to the initial incarceration of our former president. For example, uh, Bongi, um, sorry, Ngizi. Gazebe Mkunu, who is okay. the former DJ from Okozi FM, he had um, put out a series of videos on his social media accounts saying, giving the current president, Sol Ramaphosa, uh, three days to release uh, the former president or see chaos erupt in the country. So there's obviously a clear link between the unrest and, and the, the incarceration of the former president. And obviously police are now following up on those cases. They have, however, given him bail. So I think... Um, they do believe that he's linked, but they were able to, to give him bail. Some of the other incidents have been linked to Jacob Zuma. Some have been linked to the unrest particularly. And I think police are still trying to figure out which is where and how they how they, they, they link the cases. All the people have, however, been charged with inciting public violence in South Africa. And that's really clear from, from the cases that they are looking at. All right, Candice, many thanks for sharing your insights with us. Thanks. In the meantime, former President Jacob Zuma has refused to be examined by doctors appointed by the National Prosecuting Authority. His foundation says the former president refused because he's tired of his claims of ill health being treated with distrust. Earlier this month, a KwaZulu Natal High Court judge, Pete Cohen, ordered that the state may grant a medical practitioner of his choice to examine Mr. Zuma to assess his ability to stand trial for corruption. But a spokesperson for the Zuma Foundation, Zwanele Manyi, is now accusing the state of second-guessing the medical report produced by the military doctors responsible for the former president's care. Let's head to East Africa, where the leader of Tanzania's main opposition party, Freeman Umbowe, has appeared in the country's high court. He's facing terrorism charges in a case described by his party as a politically motivated move to crush dissent. Oboe, a chairman of the Chadema party, and his supporters accused police of torturing him in custody to force him to make a statement in the trial that opened under tight security. Oboe has been behind bars since July 21, when he was arrested and other senior Chadema officials in a nighttime police raid just hours before holding a public forum to demand constitutional reforms. The 59-year-old has been charged with terrorism, financing, and conspiracy. In neighboring South Sudan, heavy flooding has affected about 380 people, 80,000 people, I beg your pardon, with overflowing rivers, submerging homes, and displacing families. In a briefing note on Tuesday, the United Nations Humanitarian Agency, OCHA, warns that more heavy rains and flooding is expected in the coming month, adding that nearly three quarters of those affected are in two states, Unity and Jongale. The agency says access is a significant challenge, adding that aid workers struggle to deliver supplies to displaced populations. The agency adds that around 100,000 of those displaced in last year's disaster have still not returned home, while the Relentless rainfall has left some agricultural land submerged for well over a year. Today marks the first ever International Day for People of African Descent, who aims to celebrate the essential contributions of Africans worldwide. Speaking to reporters today in New York, UN spokesperson Stefan Dujaric read a message from the Secretary General Antonio Guterres he said the International Day would recognize the profound injustices and systemic discrimination Africans have endured for centuries and continue to confront today. The day also aims to advance social justice and inclusion policies, eradicate racism and intolerance, promote human rights 
and assist in creating better, more prosperous communities in line with the Sustainable Development Goals spearheaded also by the United Nations. Is the interna first international day of people of African descent. In his message, the Secretary General said that this day is a celebration of the enormous contributions of people of African descent to every field of human endeavor. He added it is also long overdue recognition of the profound injustices, systematic discrimination that people of African descent have endured for centuries and continue to confront today. 20 years after the Durban Declaration and Program of Action, the Secretary General said, we're experiencing unprecedented momentum towards ending the global scourge of racism. We must not squander this opportunity. This International Day is an urgent call for action for everyone everywhere to commit to rooting out the evil of racism. The full message is online. Also on the International Day for People of African Descent, this next report from our newsroom looks at the positive contributions of Africans in their host and adopted countries, as well as the discrimination they face. News Central's Omolola Ololade has more. As an African living in diaspora, the first thing that comes to mind when you see another African is not whether he or she is from Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, Zimbabwe or South Africa, but the Pan-African spirit that makes you think you have met someone from the same African descent. Pan-Africanism unifies the cultural world of Africans in diaspora and the self-determination of people from Africa. International Day for People of African Descent is a day set aside to promote the extraordinary contributions of the African diaspora around the world and to eliminate all forms of discrimination against people of African descent. Africans living outside the shores of the African continent Talk about some of the challenges they face while emphasizing the significant contributions Africans have made in the countries they live in. Well, I think the challenges I face is basically because I, I left as an older person. But you, you face a whole lot of challenges. First, you, change, you face uh, uh, the climate. Come from the hot region to the very cold region. Uh, it's always very difficult to understand how cold it is until you get there. Africans in diaspora, yes, they have contributed a whole lot. Um, you go to the hospitals especially, and um, you hear different African names, and you, you're surprised. Why is that? I think it's because Africans are doing a whole lot. They're saving lives, especially um, in this period of pandemic. With this year's theme being youth standing up against racism, the United Nations condemned the continued violent practices and the excessive use of force by law enforcement agencies against Africans and people of African descent. We see it in racial profiling, including at international borders, just on the basis of skin color. We see it in anti-black hate speech, police violence, and even the taunting of black players at football games. And right now, in this time of COVID-19, we're seeing it in unequal access to vaccines. People of African descent, particularly women and girls, confront inequalities, confront violence and discrimination every day. Inequalities that have been exacerbated by the current COVID pandemic. We must work together to tear down the barriers that deny people of African descent full economic, social, cultural, civil, and political rights. As of today, the African diaspora is one of the most important in the world in terms of numbers and impact, despite the many challenges they face. Omolola Ololade, reporting for News Central. Well, in Central Africa, the Democratic Republic of Congo authorities are say there will be for security against illegal mining at a pit that provided the uranium for bombs dropped by the United States and Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. This comes after a local human rights campaigner, Paul Kisimba, said illicit miners have been entering the Shinkolobwe mine in the southeastern Democratic Republic of Congo searching for cobalt and copper, which fetch high prices. Kisimba said several cameras would be installed to provide additional surveillance.
Now let's go to West Africa, where the UN Security Council has renewed for a year sanctions imposed against targeted individuals and entities in Mali for obstructing the 2015 peace agreement. The sanctions include a year-long travel ban and an asset freeze to last until August 31 next year. Those targeted are accused of planning, implementing or perpetrating acts that violate international humanitarian law, including attacks on medical or humanitarian personnel. They had been due to expire today. To achieve a national, big national growth and creation and development, Nigeria needs competent leadership to end its daunting security challenges and the remote causes of insecurity must be identified and tackled headlong. Good governance remains the panacea to ending security challenges in Nigeria. Though every country has its challenge, Nigeria's most significant problem seems to be insecurity. Security system, lack of access to education, health care, ransom payments for terrorism, banditry and kidnapping are some of the major reasons insecurity continues to ravage Nigeria and other African nations. Lack of access to education, health care and welfare. Sokoto State Governor and Chairman of the People's Democratic Party Governors Forum, Honorable Amin Waziri Tambuar, says there are over 20 reasons insecurity persists in Nigeria and if they are resolved, Nigeria will be a better secured nation. Tambuwal made this remark while delivering a lecture titled Security Challenges in Nigeria and its Implications for Sustainable Development. This security in Nigeria not only competes with actual development items for budgetary funding, it also distracts development, it also distracts government from concentrating on strengthening our institutions, which in turn will ensure the attainment of these important sustainable development goals. Nigeria has one of the highest budgets in Africa, military budget in Africa. This is, of course, this excludes what state governments are doing and spending on security in their respective states. The remote causes of insecurity must therefore be identified and tackled headlong if we are to succeed in our bid to achieve national growth, cohesion, and development. Other stakeholders at the event also advised the federal government of Nigeria on other ways to tackle insecurity. If we don't address our population growth, this will continue even if we had a lease office. I don't know why the poor people, for instance, a jobless man will marry four wives. I think that leadership is key. Uh, we can buy all the weapons, as I said earlier. If we don't deal with the economy that has direct effect on insecurity, we're just wasting our time. Because of the importance of security, we need to understand that we need to rethink everything we're doing in view of getting secured first. Because without security, you can't do anything. Whatever we're doing so far, we must admit it's not working. Well, there is a need for all hands to be on deck from the federal and state governments to the security agencies and the citizens to solve the insecurity challenges which has become a drain on state coffers and national development. 22 trafficked Nigerians bound for Tripoli, Libya were rescued in the neighboring Niger Republic. The National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons says the victims were between 15 and 20 years old. Zone of commander of the agency Abu Bakr Bashir told journalists in the northwestern state of Sokoto that the victims are mainly from the southern part of Nigeria. He says the victims were handed over to NAPTIP, the agency responsible for that for trafficked persons, uh, to the on, for onward transmission to the immigration service at the border. Coming up on the news, Botswana has recorded its first cases of the highly mutated COVID-19 variant known as C12. Details of this and more when the news returns.
Well, if you just joined us, you're welcome. You're watching Continental Prime here on New Central Television, coming to you live from Nigeria's economic capital, Lagos. Now, the uniform benchmark for admission into tertiary institutions in Nigeria has been reviewed by the body responsible for conducting entrance examinations for tertiary level institutions. The Joint Admissions and Matriculation Board announced the new arrangement on Tuesday at the body's 2021 policy meeting held at Nigeria's capital, Abuja. According to the new arrangement, universities are not allowed to go below 120 marks, while polytechnics and colleges of education are not permitted to go below 100 for admission. Professor Adilike Fakoye of the Department of English at the Lagos State University joins me now. Good to see you, uh, Professor Fakoye. Now, this new development, is this not uh, a reduction of educational standards in a nation where universities are already poorly rated in the world? I'm quite sure it wasn't so when you gain entrance. Professor Fakoye, I hope you can hear me. Not set up standards by reducing cutoff marks from maybe 200 to below 200, which is evident. The questions we can ask are maybe two or three questions. The first question is, what harm do we have? What what danger? What injury does having a standard cutoff mark do to the status of any Nigerian university? In other words. What do we lose by making sure that people who do not pass jam cannot end that university? What is this sense in making a how would anybody score 150 out of 400 and then be, be, be given admission to university? Why can't we allow these children who cannot make it to the university to go to a vocational college or maybe something lower than the university. And then this kind of situation is empowered by, you know, um, changing the status of our colleges of education, technology, and so on, to that of the university. What is the need for that? So there is some people, there's a scheme, right, being set up by some people to reduce everything to nothing. And therefore, what you will find is that public universities are the losers for it. They cannot become standards anyway. Look at all the universities we have in Nigeria competing with all those other universities across, I mean, across the world. This time, how would any university, for instance, in the north of Nigeria, compete with any university, maybe in Brazil, in Ghana, or any other maybe growing economy like ours? So to me, I think we are destroying our standards rather than empowering the universities by not allowing our students to pass, by allowing fail marks to be a cutoff. You know, uh, Pro Professor Fakir, you've raised quite a, a very important point here. And uh, if, you, if you go back in time, you, you'll notice that um, some educationists and experts like yourself had said uh, the university system is not for all commerce. And that was when the 6334 system was put in place so that some people can actually get off from the uh, junior school and for those who want to proceed to the high school can get off or proceed to the university. So uh, what can Nigeria do now? Knowing full well that Nigeria's uh, highest ranked tertiary institution at the moment is the University of Ibado, which is a poorly rated also at 1,258 globally. Uh, you know, Endorsing failure as, 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 a, as success, looking at 120 as a pass mark. Uh, how can this be reversed? Well, it can be reversed one way, well, just one way. You see, the psyche of the Nigerian student needs to be modified. Every Nigerian student needs to see himself or herself as, for instance, if you say my university, Lagos State University, if you say Lagos State University is number two in Africa, or number 10 in Africa, every student needs to see himself or herself as number 10 student in Africa, as number two student in Africa. So if University of Ibadan is occupying 1,000 and something, something, you know, 
then that means that every student in that university is 1,000 something in position okay, compared to other students in other universities across the world. Okay, so what we can do now is get somebody who is interested in and who is very, very, very well versed in education to be the Minister for Education at the national level and Commissioners for Education at the state levels. So until we have meaningful people who are very knowledgeable, occupying positions of direction, administration, and so on, of education, we can't get anything. We can't, we, can't, we can't get out of these woods. If you look at Nigeria very well, the people that made Nigeria work, the people that made Nigeria what Nigeria was before, let us say, 1997 or 98, Every one of them attended a polytechnic. I wouldn't say the polytechnic. A polytechnic. Now, all these people had hands-on experience how to do this, how to do that. Today, we just concentrate on so many things. We want to see how education is administered in, in Bangladesh, and they will make out of Pakistan the standard for this place and so on. So all of these things create confusion. And what we can do is standardize our own criteria here. Let whatever is used in Lagos State or in, in Norio State or in Taraba State be the same national uniform standard. It should not be 150 can enter university in this state, 80 can enter university in this state, 50 can enter in this state. In other words, we are creating so many Nigerias within the same country. How, for instance, would you expect um, somebody who entered university using 50 marks out of 400, how would you expect that kind of person to compete with somebody who scored 250 and they are studying the same course, maybe medicine? So would you want to be, would you want to undergo a surgery, you know, um, conducted by somebody who scored 50 in, in jump and then who has very poor marks, and then the person just gets pushed on and pushed on until graduating. Would you want to be operated upon by somebody like that, or somebody who has gone through the meal and the person really has the thing? So Nigeria belongs, as I see now, okay, to a failed people. Failure is going to be our standard. Then we can't we can't expect anything, nothing. Okay. Well, uh, uh, Professor Leki Fakoya, many thanks for your time and thanks for sharing your insights with us. Now to our continued coverage of the coronavirus pandemic across the continent, uh, Botswana has recorded its first case of the highly mutated C12 COVID-19 variant. Deputy Coordinator for the Presidential Tax Force for COVID-19 Musapeli Musapeli announced on Tuesday, adding that it was difficult to know if the variant had already spread or was just an isolated case. Uh, uh, Musapeli said Botswana is the uh, ninth country to confirm the variant and the only other in the region apart from South Africa. Botswana has so far recorded close to 157,000 positive cases with uh, over 2,300 or almost 2,300 related deaths. Staying in Southern Africa, a uh, Mozambican doctors' organization has raised concern that some doctors remain unemployed despite the health sector's struggles during the COVID-19 pandemic. The head of the Order of Doctors of Mozambique, Gilberto Mahicha, says uh, it had about 200 members without a job. He said it did not make sense that doctors had no job during a pandemic. He was speaking during a radio program on the role of professional organizations in the fight against COVID-19 in Mozambique. Now, more than 4 million Nigerians have now been vaccinated against COVID-19. The National Primary Healthcare Development Agency disclosed this while updating the second phase of COVID-19 vaccination in Abuja, saying several state governments have done relatively well in encouraging their residents to receive the jabs. The agency, however, urged the public to always seek the correct information about the COVID-19 vaccines in order not to be driven by mischief and fake news. In East Africa, more than 2 million Kenyans have now been vaccinated according to data released on Tuesday by the country's health ministry. 
Of those vaccinated, 1.96 million are first doses, while more than 804,000 are second doses. The ministry also says 565 people tested positive for COVID-19 on Tuesday, taking the total number of COVID-19 cases closer to 236,000. Today's figures also show that over 223,000 patients have recovered from the virus, while fatalities rose to 4,726. We go to North Africa, where Egypt is ramping up production of the Sinovac coronavirus vaccine. It aims to become a hub for vaccine exports to Africa and protect its population of more than 100 million from the fourth wave of infections. President of the state-run holding company for biological products and vaccines, Dr. Heba Wali, says uh, Egypt is set to announce its partnership with a European company adding a million doses for the Vasera Sinovac jab have already been distributed within the country. She also dismissed doubts about the efficacy of the Sinovac vaccine, citing its approval by the World Health Organization. Moving away from the coronavirus pandemic, but uh, still looking at health. African traditional medicine is still not getting the recognition or support it deserves and requires to thrive. And on this year's African Traditional Medicine Day, more research and government support has been called for if the sector is expected to improve. News Central correspondent Bernard Akedi was at a lecture and exhibition where the challenges of African traditional medicine were discussed and suggestions for its improvement. Every August 31st, the World Health Organization celebrates African Traditional Medicine Day to promote the important role of the continent's rich biodiversity of medical plants and herbs in improving well-being. The theme for this year's celebration is Traditional Medicine, Research and Development. And at the Institute of African and Diaspora Studies in the University of Lagos, to better enlighten the general public on the benefits of traditional medicine, a seminar and exhibition was organized. Um, the program we are having today is on traditional medicine. And it's, a, it's an international um, program. This is our own version of it. Trying to contribute to the body of knowledge on traditional medicine all over the world. African traditional medicine for long has been misunderstood and shrouded in mystery. Scholars at the university say the only way to improve the use, sale and quality of African traditional medicine will be to invest in research. That we need to do enough research to find out about the, the, the properties of the herbs that we are using. And talk about um, concentration, talk about measurement, be able to talk about side effects. There are four levels of traditional medicine. You have the general that everybody knows. The second one are the retailers. The third one are the real people who understand medicine and who understand the physiology and prescribe. The fourth level is where the divination takes place. And so in the past, there has been that blow, no division. And so religion, Christian religion, Abrahamic religion will not go well with the fourth level. But people have, in the past, lumped off four levels together. Scholars of African traditional medicine have called on the government to throw its weight and give African traditional medicine the kind of support that orthodox medicine enjoys. The government has not realized the enormity of advantages that are derivable from accepting and validating traditional medicine. It is the gold mine of the century. The World Health Organization believes that more work is needed to integrate traditional medicine into orthodox health system and to strengthen partnerships and mobilize resources, particularly for research and development. Bernard Akede, New Central Lagos. Johnson & Johnson says that its experimental vaccine failed to provide enough protection against HIV in sub-Saharan Africa 
to young women at high risk of being infected. The study testing the vaccine included the participation of 2,600 women across five southern African countries, where women and girls accounted for over 60% of all new HIV infections last year. JNJ says that it is studying the safety and efficacy of a different composition of the vaccine regime among men who had sex with men and transgender persons. The United States supported the trial of the vaccine, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In Nigeria, 559 cholera cases and 43 death have been confirmed in the country's northeastern state of Burnu. The state's commissioner of health, Juliana Beatrice, confirmed the cases and fatalities during a news conference on Tuesday. She noted that the issues were recorded in Goza, Kaga, Hawala, Magumeri, Damboa, and the capital Maiduguri. The commissioner who said that the state did not record any disease outbreak in 2019 and 2021 says the state government has constituted rapid response teams for disease surveillance and control in the affected local government areas. She asked the public to take preventive measures against the disease by observing strict hygiene practice. So I heard Canada has agreed to resettle about 5,000 Afghan refugees evacuated by the United States. More on this at this time at Join us again. Canada says that it would resettle some 5,000 Afghan refugees evacuated by the United States. The 5,000 refugees evacuated by the United States will be resettled as part of a previously announced Canadian plan to accept more than 20,000 vulnerable Afghans who had already left the country. They include women leaders, human rights workers and reporters. Canada says that it hopes to help Afghans who want to resettle as long as the Taliban allows them to leave. Kenya's half-year tea exports rose 19% compared to a similar period in 2020. In a statement on Tuesday, the Tea Board of Kenya said exports stood at 296.7 million kilograms in the first six months of 2021, up from 250.6 million kilos in a similar period in 2020. Despite the rise in exports, General production declined significantly to stand at 274.1 million kilos in the half year, down from 300.7 million kilos in a similar period in 2020. Month to month, exports shrank in June to 45.2 million kilos, down from 50.8 million in May. The Central Bank of Nigeria has directed all banks to publish the names and bank verification number of defaulters of its forex policy. In a memo on Tuesday, the Apex Bank says defaulters of the policy are those using fake visas and cancelling air tickets at the purchase of personal travel allowance and business travel allowance. In the memo, the regulator explained that the practice would affect the integrity and stability of the forex market. Nigeria's federal government says over 450,000 persons have benefited from its payroll support scheme out of about 500,000 targeted by the government. The Minister of State for Industry, Trade and Investment, Mariam Katagum, said that there is one updating journalist on the nation's MSME recovery program following the crippling effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on micro, small and medium scale businesses. Katagum, who says the program has largely been a success, adds that other interventions like the general MSME grant scheme saw the federal government of Nigeria disperse almost 57 billion naira to beneficiaries. So under the payroll support scheme, our initial target was to reach 500,000 beneficiaries. Currently, our standing is, is put at 409, uh, 
459,334 successful beneficiaries across the 36 states and the FCC. Out of this number, we have recorded 43%. This is business on NC Continental Prime. Eskom Holdings looks set to spend 106 billion rand, about 7.2 billion dollars, on wind and solar energy by 2030. A company presentation showed that South Africa's power utility is prepared to spend 61.75 billion rand on wind power and 44.25 billion rand on solar energy by the end of the decade. Some of the projects are planned on the sites of coal-fired plants that are scheduled to close. The investment plan, which ESCOM could carry out by itself or in partnership, is the most detailed demonstration yet of its ambition to move away from coal by taking advantage of the nation's abundant wind and solar resources. ESCOM's plans have been publicly opposed by the country's energy minister, who says such a transition could eliminate thousands of coal-dependent jobs. The presentation outlines three phases for investment once funding and regulatory approvals have been secured. And the countdown is on as South Africa's state-owned carrier, South African Airways SAA, has announced plans to resume flights from September 23rd. This comes after SAA completed a 17-month business rescue process in April 2021 and nearly two years after its flight operations were grounded. The airline has suspended flights in response to the adverse effects of COVID-19, which led to international travel restrictions, worsening its long-standing financial woes. However, the sale of a 51% stake of SAA to a private sector consortium has not yet been concluded. This means the airline will resume operations without the $201.3 million working capital initially promised by the consortium that plans to purchase the shares. The airline says it will initially just operate flights from Johannesburg to Cape Town, Kinshasa, Accra, Lusaka, Maputo, and Hariri. Other destinations will be added to the network as operations wrap up in response to market conditions. From taking off in South Africa to the skies over East Africa, the Ethiopian Airlines Group and the Boeing Company have signed a strategic memorandum of understanding on positioning Ethiopia as an aviation hub for Africa. Ethiopian and Boeing have agreed to work in partnership in four areas of strategic collaboration, namely industrial development and advanced aviation training. Joint multidisciplinary teams have been established to implement the strategic partnership and important milestones have already been registered. And we stay in the region with Telcom Kenya announcing plans to invest in another submarine fiber optic cable system that seeks to connect Kenya with Asia and Europe. The cable has key landing points in Kenya, Pakistan, and France, with its second phase planned to extend to South Africa. The undersea cable is owned by the Chinese firm Peace Cable International Network. This will be the sixth undersea cable to land in Mombasa, after the East African Marine System, of which Telcom is a shareholder, and the privately owned Seacom. The project is expected to be concluded by the end of 2021. Telcom Kenya is also a shareholder in the Eastern Africa Submarine Cable System, the Lower Indian Ocean Network, and the Djibouti Africa Regional Express One Cable Systems, stretching over 4,854 kilometers under the sea and initially estimated to cost 200 and $35 million. In the central region, the Democratic Republic of Congo is set to review its $6 billion infrastructure for minerals contract with Chinese investors, citing concerns that the country is not sufficiently benefiting from the deal. The government has formed a commission to reassess the reserves and resources at China, Mali Bidun's Penke, Fun Gurume Copper and Cobalt Mine, it is also seeking to lay claim to its rights fairly. President Felix Tshisekedi says the 2007 deal signed with Chinese firms Sino Hydro Corp and China Railway Group Limited are also under review to ensure that they are fair and effective. Under the deal struck with former President Joseph Kabila, Sino Hydro and China Railway agreed to build roads and hospitals in exchange 
for a 68% stake in the Sicom Mines Ventures. Payment technology remains one of the most dynamically developing sectors of financial technology. Its potential and flexibility make it the perfect breeding ground for innovation, which is actively redefining digital experiences in finance. But the new frontier in finance comes with challenges. Bent Joseph tells us more in this report. With the COVID-19 pandemic decreasing offline transactions by over 60%, it comes as no surprise that the payments industry is undergoing a quiet revolution and payment technology is at the center of this transformation. Challenging traditional financial systems comes with its issues. When cash exchanges are replaced by Bitcoin trading platforms and words of cash are turned into digital wallets, how well is the future prepared for the ever-evolving payment technology space? This was the focus of the Business Day event with the theme, The Future of Paytech 2021, which brought together fintech entrepreneurs, paytech experts, thought leaders and investors as they shared their vision for the payments industry. At the start of the event, Managing Director of Business Day Media, Oho Okiti, shared his position on the development of payment technology in Nigeria and his projection on the ever-changing sector. The paytech uh, that we have seen in the last few years, we continue to evolve. I don't think we have seen the end of that uh, industry. Uh, this is an industry that is constantly evolving and it will continue to evolve. And uh, it is very, very difficult to predict, to predict um, what is going to happen even as close as just two years from now. But how is the rise of cryptocurrencies changing the narrative in the payment sector? Ray Youssef of Paxpool and Fejiro of Patricia Technologies Limited had this to say. You know, the, 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 the CBDC is coming up, the central bank in Naira is coming up, and um, we are very hopeful to see how that would pan out. Hopefully something, something interesting comes out of it. Nigeria has some of the most exceptional humans in the world. and There is something special about the people here. There's a lot of talk about the natural resources of Africa, but to me, the natural resources of Africa are found in its youth, the hearts and minds of its young people. And in nowhere else in the world is that exemplified more than in Nigeria. There are some brilliant, truly brilliant people here. Just a few days ago, I met a 22-year-old Bitcoin core developer, a Nigerian brother in Abuja. There's an army of super geniuses in this country who are currently unemployed. Imagine when you put them to work. With so many opportunities ahead of payments technology, there are challenges facing the sector, including security, user experience, integration, mobile challenge, among others. However, convenience is one of the main reasons behind the growing demand for paytech solutions. While payment gateways and payment processors give e-commerce the tools to reinvent shopping experiences, digital currency exchange and money remittance are literally breaking new grounds in terms of market penetration across the world. Experts say that this is just the beginning when it comes to meeting the market's need for online payment services. I am Bennett Joseph for New Central TV. And that's all the business we have for you on NC Continental Prime. I'm Tolu Lokwe Adilaru Balogun. There is more news coming right up. Well, a lot happening in the world of sports, especially basketball. And Udoka Unjoku has all the details. Uh, how are you doing, Udoka? Well, uh, but not so excited for the world of basketball because Nigeria actually have crashed out from the Afro Basket competition. We're looking forward to the World Cup, the much awaited draw ceremony for the FIBA Basketball World Cup 2023 qualifiers took place inside uh, one of the venues for the competition earlier on, and we saw most of the groupings for uh, the basketball groups. Now, the qualifiers draw ceremony, uh, which actually held earlier on, uh, marks the tip off for men's uh, uh, national teams are trying to successfully play their way to the FIBA Basketball World Cup 2023. Set to take place in two years in the Philippines, uh, Japan, and Indonesia, the FIBA Basketball World Cup 2023 edition marks the first time multiple countries will host this showpiece event. 80 national teams were drawn across four different draws, uh, one for, for Africa, the Americas, Asia, and Oceania, and uh, Europe. Now, the FIBA Basketball World Cup 2023 starts to take place from August 25 to the 10th of September. We see the group phase take place in the Philippines, Japan, and Indonesia. And the final phase will follow in the Philippines capital city of Manila. And Uganda's national basketball team risk being kicked out of the Afro Basket Championships because they have not got sufficient funds to pay their way. 
Now, the Silverbacks that beat former champions Nigeria 80 to 68 points to reach the quarterfinals of the tournament in neighboring Rwanda, but are being threatened with disqualification. Now, Nasser Serungjogi, the head of Uganda's Basketball Federation, said the team needed to find about 360 million Ugandan shillings, approximately $100,000, uh, to meet the expenses in Kigali. And the Silverbacks are currently relying on credit from the sports international body, FIBA, to cover costs such as accommodation, meals, and flight tickets, and were initially given a, a, a 29th of August deadline to pay up or be disqualified. Uganda is set to play Cape Verde in the quarterfinals on Thursday. And in the transfer news, Leicester have signed RB Leipzig winger Demola Lukman on a season-long loan deal with an option to buy. And the 23-year-old spent last season on loan at Fulham, making 35 appearances in all competitions and scoring four goals as the cottagers that were relegated from the Premier League. And the former Charlton winger spent two and a half years at Everton before moving to Leipzig permanently in July 2019, where he made only 13 appearances. It's the second piece of transfer deadline day business for Leicester City as uh, they've signed the uh, midfielder Dennis Prate, uh, join, joining from Syria side Torino on a season-long loan deal. And the 27-year-old joined Leicester in August 2019 and has made 60 appearances for the club in all competitions, scoring three goals. And the U.S. Open Czech fourth seed Carolina Pliskova powered past American Catherine McNally to reach the U.S. Open second round. 29-year-old sealed early breaks in both sets and fought off a reviving McNally to compete, complete a 6-3, 6-4 win. Having lost in the Wimbledon final in July, she's looking to go one better with her first Grand Slam title. And Pliskova, whose only other major final appearance came at the 2016 U.S. Open, will face Kazakhstan's Zarina Diaz or America's Amanda Amin Anemisova uh, on Monday. And Naomi Osaka and Simona Halep were among seven women's Grand Slam champions to advance to the second round of the tournament. And that's what happened to sports on NC Continental Prime. I am Udoka Njoka. Well, thanks, Udoka. And uh, still to come on the news, entertainment news with Sam Dandy, and then we'll take a look at what the weather will look like tomorrow across the continent. Thank you very much, Salai. Now let's go straight into entertainment. Now let's begin in West Africa. Now this one is particularly exciting for me. Now Mavis Records' youngest member, Aira Star, has dropped the official music video to Bloody Samaritan. Now the lead single of her 19-year uh, debut and 19-year um, album, 19 and Dangerous. Now Aira Star released the video less than seven hours ago and revealed the news to her over 500,000 Instagram fans that she directed the video herself. Now, this makes it the first track of her studio album to get an official video. Now, in fact, as a huge fan, I'm crossing my fingers and expecting that now we have one down and ten more to go. Now, with already over 100,000 views in these few hours, here's Bloody Samaritan by Aerostar. Right, I must say, not at all of 19 year olds are that successful, in fact, at that age. Congratulations to, of course, Aries Star. Now, still in West Africa, Ghanaian dance hall and reggae star Stone Boy has today disclosed that Garmo, who happens to be Ghana Music Rights Organization, has paid him 2,000 Ghana CDs in royalties. Now, the 33 year old musician, who was invited by the Ghana High Commissioner to the UK, Papa Uwu Suankoma, last week, revealed that he was shocked to receive the payment. Now, if you recall, a lot of Ghanaian musicians have attacked the body, being that the issues of music royalty still remains a big subject due to the backward technology implemented. Now, music royalties, of course, are a compensatory payment received by rights holders, being songwriters, composers, recording artists, and their respective representatives in exchange for licensed use of their music. Now, Stoneboy, who also performed alongside Nigerian singer David O, and American singer Kilani, and others at the Yam Carnival in London, also got positive buzz across social media for stopping mid his performance to help a female fan secure her wig. Now, this is absolutely funny, but you should watch this. 
All right, let's move from that one. Um, Whiskid's essence, in fact, there's so much to celebrate with Whiskid. Now, in the fourth quarter of 2020, Master Keiji's Jerusalem was the most Shazam song in the world. Well, not anymore, because today, the 31st, Whiskid's groundbreaking single, Essence, featuring Thames, has become the most searched song on the platform. Now, a lot has happened since Whiskid featured Justin Bieber on the song Essence and became the first Nigerian to debut on the Billboard's charts. Now, today, the song has gone up to 13 from last week's spot at 16. Now, due to the remix with Justin Bieber, in fact, Essence has received 23.2 million radio audience in the U.S. alone, with 87.3 thousand unit sales just last week. In fact, there's so much to celebrate, like I said, you know, for the star. And just in case you haven't heard, Whiskey has a song with Bella Schmurda off his Deluxe album released last week called Anoti. Yeah, you should check that out. Well, a lot of to celebrate in Nigeria and West Africa, to be honest. But of course, back to Salai with the rest of the news. Well, it's up to you, Sammy. You should give me a bit of uh, songs uh, from those hit songs you play from across the continent. I definitely though. will. I definitely will hook you up. Yeah, anyway, you can catch uh, pretty much more of uh, Sam Dandy on our website. And he's got plenty uh, from where that's from. Now let's look at tomorrow's temperatures across the continent as uh, put together by our weather desk. this hour but before we go let's take another look at some of the big stories authorities in south africa have arrested two more persons over the public violence that hit parts of the country last month heavy flood has affected about 380,000 people in south sudan we also told you that the united nations security council has renewed sanctions and targeted malians for obstructing the 2015 peace agreement to follow us on social media we at news central TV. You can also download our mobile app and the App Store and Play Store. You can also watch New Central Live and Star Times. Channel 274, AVO TV, Channel 23, Vision 247, Free TV, and on YouTube. I'm Suleiman. Uh, later, many thanks for watching. <laughs>